Coming up on Theater Talk. As far as diversity goes, it should include what the world is. Right. Correct. We're all here. Right. We're all in it. Right. And our art reflects that. Why isn't it all acknowledged? Right. It right. should all be acknowledged. If we're all putting something in the pool of the entertainment, all of that should be looked at. And until then, it's not fair. Yeah. Now, Susan, uh, we just saw The Color Purple, a revival on Broadway, and I have to tell you, it is one of the best musicals I have seen in a long time. It's directed by our old friend, Mr. John Doyle, making his umpteenth appearance on <laughs> Theater Talk. <laughs> now, <this> star, <laughs> star Broadway director. Oh, okay. I don't like that word old. <laughs> How about veteran? You That'll do. That? Uh, veteran, uh, veteran, veteran. veteran, yeah. Uh, John has assembled an absolutely superb <laughs> cast for the color purple, and I'm delighted tonight to be joined by Danielle Brooks as Sophia. Welcome to Theater Thank Talk. Thank you so much. Uh, a brilliant uh, new discovery for us here on Broadway. With Cynthia Arrivo as <laughs> Seely. Welcome. Uh, you, from yeah. England. Yes. Welcome yes. to America. Thank you. And, uh, oh, this um, minor <laughs> pop star you may have heard of before. Uh, what's her <laughs> name? Jennifer Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> Who is making her Broadway debut as Shug? Welcome all and congratulations. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love the chemistry among these three. Mm. Oh, yeah. And so, um, I'm going to ask Jennifer, when did you decide to commit to a Broadway show? I mean, you have a gigantic singing career. You can play all over the world. And now it's eight performances a week. Wow. For the foreseeable future. <laughs> well, it was something I've always wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and for me, in my life, I always say, you know, I have, like, <clears throat> time frames of when I want things to happen. Mm. And I said, when I turned 35, I want to do Broadway. And it just happened to be at 34, and the timing was right, and I literally got a call asking if I wanted to do Color Purple. And I was like, sure. It was like not even a second thought about it. You're a big star. Mm -hmm. Did anybody on your team say, well, Jennifer, you can't, this is a supporting role. No. No. All right. Not at all. It's just a strong part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was, it was more up to me than anything. You know, I was like, yep, I'll do it. Yep, I'll be there. You know, um, and I really didn't think much else about it. But those turned out to be the most successful things for me, the things that I'm just like, okay, whatever, do let's it. do it. And this was one of those moments. And I felt like I reacted to it color purple in that way so quickly because it's real it speaks of reality and i've always say if you are living you can relate to color purple no matter what color you are no matter what age you are it's like looking at Celie's story for instance like you sit and you watch her go through all of these life struggles and 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 setbacks and when you see her make it through it it lets you know you can make it through whatever you're going through you see the woman who's so abused, yes. this monstrous life that she is supposed to lead being conscripted into marriage. I am so haunted by the oppression that she has to overcome. Resilience. Yeah. I think that's ultimately what the story is about, resilience, right. fight, fighting through. And I think it's relatable because that's what everyone goes through. Mm -hmm. Everyone goes through in, something. In some way. You know? Yes. Um, yeah. They have, we go through that personally. Um, Sadly, so. the color purple is not out of date. No, it's no, right. completely. It, it's so current. Right. No, because the I, idea that she has to go and not only be basically raped by this guy all the time, yeah. but cook and clean for him yeah. and take care of take his care house, of and that is, house. and be separated from her sister, and right. that is her life. Yeah. Her but life. one thing I also like to bring to the table is she was definitely, she is the main character, mm -hmm. but there's also, you look at Mr. Mm -hmm. and look at his story yes. and all of the things that he's fighting against. Sophia being beaten by her husband and trying to yeah. get her marriage. Yeah. Like if you go through every character, character. we're all and dealing someone with someone to connect to. Yeah. 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 That's the hard one, isn't it? it? Mr. Mm -hmm. the, who's the man that you have to marry and who yeah. is, gives, mm -hmm. gives you a bad time about 80 yeah, we don't. We guys, we don't come off too well in uh, the color purple but in the beginning. Well, do you have <laughs> sympathy <laughs> for him in the end? You just said you did. I, I do it's, not. I, I, I never think of it as sympathy. I think that it's an acceptance of someone who didn't quite understand how to go through life and right. is just now learning. Uh, right. Oh yeah, and he a changes way. as yeah, much as she does. Yeah, he does. Mm -hmm. Very right. much so. Well, if he only knew, like an abused child, if he only right. knew right. Right. that abused right. him, yes. all he knows is how to respond to something with mm -hmm. violence. That's, right. And that's why exactly. that scene mm -hmm. with his father yes. is in that's the play. Yeah. So, right. will we right. cut the same slack to slaveholders? 
Uh, well, well, it's a different kind of thing. It's a different thing. It's not to forgive him. <laughs> she got us on that one. You know, it's not to forgive him for his behavior, but it's to understand. It. Right. Yeah. And yes. sometimes yeah. you can deal with things better when you have an understanding, understanding of where they come from. Yeah. And I think as a people, we have done that. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. yes. Right now, we're in the, we're in the Oscar time. Mm-hmm. And of course, right now, we're having this diversity, talk. diversity yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, You've worked in Hollywood. You're on a hit TV show. You will be working in Hollywood and on a hit TV show soon. Thank you. What is your reaction to this this Oscar so white controversy? I think that right now on Broadway particularly, we're having a great uh, time when it comes to diversity anyway. So I feel like we're sort of a living example of what it can be everywhere you else. You and your show, yes. Yes. Not just our show. I don't I think know, just our show. Broadway. 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 Yeah, it's Amazing. Broadway For once itself. Broadway's, Broadway's ahead of you know, everybody else. You know, <laughs> not, mm-hmm. I, I just think, I think we have to broaden what we yeah. say is diversity. Yeah. Because diversity isn't just throwing a black person no. or a black no. show into no. a space and that's called diversity. That's not diverse. Well, to me, theater and Broadway is so diverse because right. you have shows that are classical. You have new pieces. You have, you have the the plays the musicals the the hip hop that you have that's what makes up diversity yeah. to me yeah do you think though that in the business that there's this still this built in racism to the system and I don't want to say it, it, it's racism I think people aren't aware yeah. or or choosing to ignore and not understanding what what how it's affecting people yeah. I may think I, may I ask a question. Mm-hmm, please. How was it in your year when you won your Yes. Oscar? Um, in what way do you mean? Well, how was it as a young African-American woman, as a young black woman, winning an Oscar in that environment, which must have been very I, I, what, what I would say, if anything, that I do remember most is I thought it was a, a, a blessing and a little odd to be only the fourth uh-huh. African-American woman I know. to win. Um, I think as in supporting or just mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Just now it's about eight of us. Mm-hmm. You know, in our day and age, mm-hmm. that should be unheard of unheard today. Unheard of. And yeah. to be the first African-American singer to grace the cover of Vogue or the first African-American mm-hmm. anything, it's just like, we're still on the first? And in, mm-hmm. like, in leading actresses, there, I think there are only two women to have won a leading role for an Oscar. And I just think it's, is like, as far as diversity goes, it should include what the world is. Right. Correct. We're all here. Right. We're all in it. Right. And our art reflects that. Why isn't it all acknowledged? Right. It right. should all be acknowledged. If we're all putting something in the pool of the entertainment, all of that should be looked at. And until then, it's not fair. Yeah. Now, Susan, one of my favorite actors is Jeff Daniels, who not only is a terrific uh, film actor, but really one of our great American stage actors. Welcome oh, to Theater nice. Talk. Thank you. And okay. congratulations on the success of the play he is in now, giving a harrowing, brilliant and unforgettable performance in Blackbird by David Harrower at the Belasco Theater. Congratulations on the success of the play. Thank you very much. We recently had Reed Burney here. And you were his understudy I on Broadway and Gemini. I was. But tell us about that. We were talking about your understudy experience. I, uh, Marshall Mason got me, because uh, he, he, I was in New York for about a year, and, and uh, I was threatening to leave. Uh, I wanted to go back and work at the lumber company. He was going, no, you're not. Stay here. And, and he said, I'm going to give you a job as an understudy. Gemini, Albert, in, Albert Inarato's play was moving to Broadway with Danny Aiello and everybody. They had a very successful circle rep. And uh, you're going to understudy three roles. You're going to understudy Reed Burney, Bob Picardo, and Jonathan Hodari. John, yeah. And I'm going, wow, wow, Broadway. <laughs> I can do that. And I literally had colored the script in four, three different colors. I had it down. I could do each one. I was there every night for five months. Never went up. <laughs> Never went up. I remember Picardo throwing up in a bucket. <laughs> At five minutes to eight, going, Bob, I'm in the clothes. I'm in the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the professionals. But my my fr- friends of mine, like Harvey Firestein, say, you know, we, we, with some of the kids, he's a hairspray. They, you know, they go to the dentist and they call out for the whole day. Oh, yes, man. your we thoughts doing, on that. Yeah. We, we were doing God of Carnage. We heard about West Side, was it West Side Story? Yes, the kids, yeah, they were, yeah. yeah. Kids were driving, they'd get hung over. They wouldn't show exactly. up for the Wednesday matinee. And I remember telling Gandolfini, Jim was sort of new to the theater scene, 
we hired the understudies, you know, in, or, or, uh, in, during previews. And Jim said, when do they go on? I said, they go on in Baltimore. They go on in Philly. They go on in D.C. We don't miss a show. Yeah. Did he miss? Or did he never Jim miss? Jim Gandolfini never missed a Great. show. Yeah. 256 shows from March 1st to Thanksgiving. Didn't miss a show. That's good. So then we heard about the West Side Story kids dropping out. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, let me over there. Let me over there. <laughs> let me over there. What would you say? Yeah. I mean, yeah, what would you say? Get out of here. I'd say get out of here. Go home. You're not. This isn't, this isn't how it's done. It's okay. It's okay. We don't, you don't need, we don't need you. I'm not naming names. We recently had a, a, a big, though aging movie star starring in a play, and he had an IFB in his ear, and he did not have stage presence. But I'm sure that his people lulled him into believing he could do it. I'm not going to bash guys who, yeah. who didn't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, Pacino had gotten, for China Doll, had gotten written up about that. And, uh, I, you know, I'm well, here. Well, but he was better than, I, than you think. And I'm not in my 70s and it's right. you just yeah. can't keep yeah. them in there and yeah. so and i know that's been but this isn't someone. him no no but um if it's just laziness if it's just you and your approach you don't need to be here but it's isn't it a different skill a different energy to hold oh stage of course Oh my God! I mean, in Blackbird, imagine if we had earwigs in in Blackbird. We're waiting for some guy with a script. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I told Michelle, I said we're going to get good reviews just because we know our damn. Life. Exactly. <laughs> I have been harping on this in my column. They. It's, you have a job to do, and if you're an actor on the stage, the job is how to much know are they the paying? Line. How much are they paying right. to see you on Broadway? Too much money, but you have an obligation to the people paying this amount of money to throw everything you got at it eight times a week. I don't give a damn if it's a Wednesday matinee. Yeah, right. Throw everything you got at it. Otherwise, go home. Get somebody else. And that goes to the kids that are dropping out and not, not eh, I didn't come in Thursday night, but it's, get out of here. Get out of here. You don't get it. Um, bring everything you got every night. Find a way to get there every night. It's not okay to phone it in. It's not okay to kind of sort of do it because it's Thursday. I hope you don't think I'm being rude. Why did you take Dumber Dumber 2? Car the career was yeah, not yeah. going well. For Dumb and Dumber 2? Oh, 2? Yes. I want to be with Jim again. Oh, you want to be with Jim. Okay. How much money? I wanted to be with well, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> hey, work is work. Because I you, really did want to be with Jim again. And it, I, didn't, I, it didn't affect you, but you've just been Will McAvoy. Will McAvoy. Oh, but that's the fun of it. That was upside though. That's the fun of it, because guys like Michael, are, they'll write and they'll go, well, or not, but <laughs> certainly in Hollywood, yeah. Hollywood, they'll go, okay, th they want to brand you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you see the action guys, you know, the, yeah. the yes. Cruises and, they're, they're branded, and the Schwarzeneggers yeah. <laughs> and the Stallone, all those guys, the action guys, Bruce Willis, and, and they've got great careers. God bless them. I mean, they were doing that since Gable and Tracy. Yeah. You'd tag sure. me, you'd get the one thing, Edward right. G. Robinson, mm -hmm. and you'd play to that. And you had a great career. You made a lot of money. Yeah. It's great. That's okay. I just want to do that. To win the Emmy for McAvoy on a Sunday night, which, by the way, was a huge surprise in that room when yeah. we called my name. Really? So Even not to you? me. Not to me. Oh, I never was, trust it. me. Yeah. I was really? at someone else's party. Oh, well. And, it, and <laughs> when they said my name. And the Emmy goes to Jeff Daniels. There was a woman behind me as I was getting up said, what? <laughs> Got up. But to win the Emmy on a Sunday night and then Tuesday morning, Day one of Dumb and Dumber Two, <laughs> crossing right. the street, right. getting off right. the bus <laughs> with a butt crack showing. <laughs> I'm going, yeah, I think this is range. <laughs> All right. Susan, we've come to the end of yet another Broadway season. Another Broadway season. So to make sense of all the musicals and plays that we've seen, to sort the good from the bad, we have invited our esteemed panel of critics. Uh, welcome my colleague Elizabeth Vincentelli from the New York Post. Hello. Ben Brantley from the New York Times. Hello. And Peter Marks from the Washington Post. Elizabeth, uh, on Evo... Uh, <laughs> the different kind of director, Evo Vodafone. <laughs> Very different. Very different, yes. I mean, 
he's European, and there is this uh, European style where the play becomes secondary to the concept of the. Well, direction. it's not secondary at all. It's just mm-hmm. a different, to, just a different way to approach it. Mm-hmm. The play is not secondary at all in the crucible. What, the crucible, the ball, or a view from the bridge, which he directed. It's it. very much there. It's just a different way to approach it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in the case of someone like Ivo Van Hove dealing with Arthur Miller, especially with the Crucible, what's important is he doesn't have the baggage of having grown up with it and having mm-hmm. enjoyed right. it in high school. I think that's right. It really comes smart. at yeah. it. It comes yeah. at it from a yeah. like I had never seen the Crucible. I didn't grow up with it. Right. You know. So right. McCarthyism isn't really a, a European issue, so he doesn't no. have to deal with it. To bring back the Crucible, which is a fabulous production mm. in my estimation, lovely, yeah. we all seem to yeah. agree. You know, the idea of like ma- bringing back to the idea of the supernatural in that play, and yeah. and trying to understand, you know, what people in the 17th century might have thought about supernaturalism, and, and and transpose that to what we think today, and and it's certainly so relevant given what's going on in this country oh, with yes. you know mm-hmm. the belief systems right. like run amok on right. social media through this you know crazy well it campaign. is just i mean and to shift briefly to a view from the bridge uh which i hope doesn't get forgotten uh since it's no longer with us i mean that mean for tony's you mean yeah tony? uh that uh, the, he he brought i mean that is essentially a greek tragedy and arthur miller wrote it as a greek tragedy but in every naturalistic production when you have you know the lawyer uh sort of pontificating saying, i'm telling you the story of a man and i can't unsee it 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 never quite fit to, fits together. And to put it into what is essentially a classical Greek mm-hmm. amphitheater environment in modern terms, it just makes it so raw. And it seems like it's happening forever, sort of in eternity. I think having someone like Ivo Van Hove on Broadway is just as seismic as having Hamilton. Right. I'm really serious because it's opening people's eyes to a different style of directing on Broadway that we'd never see on I Broadway. I think that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. And people will say, oh, Hamilton is revolutionary. Actually, no, it's not. Only in one way. The show itself is non revolutionary, neither in structure nor form. What's revolutionary about it, it's its impact. And having someone like Ivo Van Hove on Broadway is just as revolutionary because people now will be like, I don't, it doesn't have to be naturalistic. I can have right. just like this empty set and a shower of blood. That's okay. Yeah, it I, happens. So, in a way, yes. you, you're getting people used and audiences to a new grammar, a new vocabulary, a new system of thinking about a play. That's opening up to, like, it's opening up so many options. I study the historical background. I mm-hmm. know where it, I know, I read this fabulous book now, The Witches, you know, yeah. where, which, when you read that, you know everything. But to put that literally on stage in a realistic way that doesn't interest me too much, I think that's much better for movies or things like that. And the theater is, a, is a, for me, a world of imagination. We should tell the audience that buys tickets stories that, that are important for them for us today, you know, and not like yesterday, not like, oh, in, in somewhere in time, people were like that. No, we are still like that. Listen, these people in Salem believe that witches exist, mm. that, the, the, that the unnatural, or the, how do you say that in good English, the, not that, that that exists, that there are things that we cannot see, but that we feel, and that, are, that for them it's there. So I wanted also the audience to have that sense, mm. you know, like, oh, Perhaps it's real. Oh, Betty, she flies. Oh, she, oh, yes. Oh, did I see that? Oh, it's gone already. Mm. You know. So I wanted this, this feeling of. I wanted the audience to be part of that community and not look at these crazy people believing in witches. George, what is the story of your life that inspired this musical? Well, I uh, grew up in two U.S. internment camps. I was five years old at the time that the uh, soldiers came to our home in Los Angeles. And literally at bayoneted gunpoint, we were ordered out of our home. And this was 1942, right? 1942, yes. I just turned five years old in uh, April 20th, and it was a few weeks after that. And we were taken from our home to the horse stables of Santa Anita Racetrack because the camps weren't uh, finished uh, building yet. And uh, each family was assigned one horse stall. Uh, I had two siblings. Um, my baby sister was still a baby, not, a, not yet a year old, and my brother was a year younger. And all five of us were to sleep in this smelly horse stall. But to five-year-old me, living in that horse stall was a lot of fun because <laughs> I could smell the horses. We get to, to sleep where the horses sleep. So, it, you know, my experience is that of a child from five to eight and a half totally different from that of my parents 
And how did the American government explain the relocation to your parents at the moment it was happening? It was for national security. Mm -hmm. And we happened to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And there was no other explanation beyond that. We were innocent American citizens. My mother was born in Sa uh, Sacramento, California. Mm. My father was a San Franciscan. We, uh, the kids were born in Los Angeles. And yet, because of our race, we were rounded up and imprisoned. And it was the most egregious violation of the Constitution because there were no charges, and therefore we had no trial. You need charges to, to challenge in order to have a trial. And uh, they took everything from us. My father says they took my business, they took our home, they took our freedom, and we had punishment. But you didn't stay in the stables the entire time. You were eventually moved... It was just a few months, right. and when the, comp uh, the construction was completed, we were pu uh, put on a train and transported two-thirds of the way across the country to the swamps of uh, southeastern Arkansas. Tell about the loyalty questionnaire, mm -hmm. There were two key questions. One asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? And the government sent this to all the interned? Everyone over 17, mm -hmm. or, uh, of the age of 17, mm -hmm. had to respond to it, whether you were male or female, 17 or 87, immigrant or American citizen. And that question being asked of an 87-year-old immigrant mm -hmm. lady was outrageous. It's preposterous, asking her to bear arms to defend the United States. But even more insidious, was question 28, which was one sentence with two conflicting ideas. It asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States and forswear your loyalty to the emperor of Japan? The word forswear assumes that there's an existing loyalty, an inborn racial loyalty to the emperor. And so if you answered, no, I don't have a loyalty to, to the emperor to forswear, then you were saying no to the first part of the very same sentence do I swear my loyalty to the United States? If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, you were then confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor and now we're ready to forswear it and re-pledge your loyalty to, to the United States, thus justifying the internment. It was one of those, when did you stop beating your wife mm -hmm. questions. It was outrageous and my parents said, we will not grovel before this government. They took everything from us, and now they want our dignity. When did you become aware that that was your parents' attitude? I was a child then, but when I became a teenager, um, I was inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King, and I became active in the civil, uh, civil rights movement. I did a, a civil rights musical, and I met Dr. King, and that was one of the most thrilling experiences to shake his hand and share some words with him. And I couldn't rec reconcile all these ideals that the civil rights movement was fighting for with what I knew to be my childhood of imprisonment. So I had many long after dinner conversations with my father. And I learned about our democracy from this man who lost everything in and the middle of And didn't get it life. back. And didn't get no, it no. back. He had to start from scratch. When, we, uh, when the war ended, we came back to Los Angeles, and our first home was on Skid Row oh. in downtown L.A. How old was your father at that point? He was in his late 30s. Mm. So, you know, he has ha had every right to be embittered, and yet he told teenage me that our democracy is a people's democracy, and it can be as great as a people can be, but it is also as fallible as people are. Our democracy is vitally dependent on people who cherish our ideals and actively engage with the process. And then one Sunday afternoon, he took me downtown to the Adlai Stevenson for President headquarters. And he says, we volunteered, but he actually volunteered me. <laughs> and I, there I was with passionate people who worked so hard to get Governor Stevenson elected president. We failed, but I understood what our democracy is yeah. then. You have to be actively engaged. And, and so ever since then, I've been uh, a political activist.
our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.